And uh, uh, before we get into that, I just I also want to give a, a praise report this morning and thank everyone for their prayers and, and uh, um, yeah, just support and time that I was um, granted and, and, and given. After years and years and hours and hours of studies, um, I eventually finished my master's degree and... <laughs> One thing that I have realized in life is that is only a piece of paper. That's it. If you cannot live <coughs> what's in this book, that piece of paper means nothing. Amen? Amen? But I give the Lord the glory and honor, the praise and the thanks. And then if you will allow me, I did do this last week, but I, I want to I appeal to my, my, my church this morning for physical help. I desperately, desperately need your help as brothers and sisters if you choose to. So as we get into the Gospels, again, as uh, I said last week, um, we've got these books available. Um, so we've got um, a devotional on Matthew and a devotional on, on Mark. Um, anyone is interested in that? Uh, we've got a, a devotional on Luke. And a devotional on John for those who are courageous. We said last week we've got the 365 day in becoming a true disciple of Christ. And then we've got a 50 day devotional on um, the book of Genesis. Okay, And then um, we launched a, a new one this week. And it is 40 week devotional for expecting moms. Now, now. Someone might sit here and say, listen, son, <laughs> what experience do you have in that? If you have a look right there, I had a, a consultant that I worked with on this book that has got all the experience that I needed to be able to put this together. Family, what, what I, I want to ask from the left-hand side of my heart this morning. Yes, sister. Okay, I'm going to get to, to that now. Thank you. When did you look, if I may ask? Oh, okay. That, that, that was my fault. Um, Wednesday, everything went live. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I want to ask, family, is, is this. Um, I desperately need to sell a massive amount of these books. If you are personally not interested in it, please can I ask that you advertise it for us. Amen. So that in a few months' time, if my children come to me and they say, Please, sir, may I have a little more soup? <laughs> I can say, yes, my hungry child, you can. Because the good people at Altham Baptist Church bought the book. Amen. 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 Thank you. Done and dusted. Let's get into Luke chapter 1 this morning. We're going to go verse for verse. Family. Why I feel in my spirit the Lord chose Luke to start off with is Luke concentrates on um, uh, healings in his gospel. And so each one of us sitting here this morning has got a certain area in our life where we need healing. Amen? Whether it's emotional, physical, spiritual, whether it, it is in your marriage, whether it's your relationship with your children. And so the Gospel of Luke is going to guide us um, into how to get that healing. Because if we go through the Gospels, and, and as we started uh, last week, we, we know the Gospels consist of four books, Matthew, Mark, and then uh, James and John. And, and so... We know, yep, is it? No. no, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Almost said Joseph and Mary. But anyway, um, so if we go through the Gospels, we can see that the Lord gives us recipes, family, on how to live a successful life as a disciple here on earth. And, and yes, I spoke to a sister before we started um, uh, the, this, uh, the worship this morning. Um, being a Christian, easy. Very. You can come to church on a, on a Sunday and the rest of the week you can live as you want. No one will attack you. No one will, will persecute you. So it's easy to be a Christian. 
But to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, different story. Because then it's no longer a religion or a tradition, then it is a lifestyle. And then everything we do and say is because the Word of God taught us to do and say it. And then you are going to get people that are going to stand up against you and persecute you and speak against you and step on you and use you as a doormat. And, and, and so um, going into the Gospels, we are going to see that. We start off with Luke 1 verse 1 this morning. The Bible says, this is Luke writing this to us. Let's read it as if this is a letter that we have just received from our brother Luke. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Here, Luke is telling us that he is not the only one writing about Jesus. Many of the disciples and Paul and the apostles wrote of Jesus. We see here um, that they all believed. Because if you go through the stories, you can see it all um, is put together like a puzzle. There is no question about their belief in Jesus. No question at all. Okay? Although Luke wrote direct divine revelation inspired by the Holy Spirit, he acknowledged the work of others who had sat down in writing events from Christ's life. Most of those sources have been lost um, except the inspired Gospels. Amen and amen. For those brothers that sat down all those years, and remember family, they didn't have Google, they didn't have um, um, computers, they, they sat in persecution, sometimes in prison. Um, Paul wrote the majority of his letters when he was in prison. Uh, we, we saw uh, our brother John in Patmos wrote his um, letters in, in prison. And that was by candlelight um, with whatever they could write on. And so about 60%, for those who have knowledge of this, you'll be able to, to note this, about 60% of the material in the Gospel of Mark is repeated in Luke. And Luke seems to follow Mark's order of events closely. Now, um, for those wondering why this is, we can see that in the book of Acts, for those who don't know, uh, Luke wrote the book of Acts as well, traveled a lot with um, uh, Paul um, and with Mark. And so they had a lot to do, a lot of time to spend together to sit down and to speak about Jesus. And, and hey, I must tell you about this story that Jesus did there in Capernaum. And, and then we went to this place and then we went to that place. And he sat down and because he was an intelligent man, Luke, he was a physician, a doctor, and the only Gentile to write a gospel. He was educated. He sat down and he listened to what they said and he wrote it down. Um, and so that's also why we are starting off in uh, the book of, of Luke. Luke proposed to narrate the ministry of Christ um, in an authoritative, logical and factual order. This man was concentrated on facts. You go through the gospel, he did not make a mistake. He spoke about facts. Okay, um, verse 2, just as they were handed down, he's speaking about the, 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 the men writing, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Beautiful. Servants of the word. Ask yourself that question this morning, family. Am I just a seat warming Christian or am I a servant of the Word of God? Huge difference. Amen. Massive difference. The one is a label, the other one is a lifestyle. That you love everything about the gospel so much you go out and you live there. Amen. And so we take that Luke's primary sources were the apostles themselves who believed facts about Jesus or who delivered facts about Jesus' life and teachings both orally 
and by means of re um, recorded memoirs in written documents um, made available to Luke. So as he traveled with them, they would exchange these documents and Luke would sit down and he would write this account that we are going into this morning. Um, in any case, Luke made um, no pretense of being an eyewitness himself, but explained that these were facts supported by careful research. Okay? This man is writing here to us a thesis. That's what he's doing. Based on facts about Jesus. Um, if you have never been through the book of Luke family, go and climb into it um, and, and read. We, we're about to read something in the book of Luke that I can guarantee some of us sitting here have never heard before. Verse 3, with this in mind, listen what Luke says, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Thank you, brother Luke. Amen. An orderly account that he wrote for us. And a most excellent Theopolis. We're going to get into who that man is right now. Literally, yep, having uh, traced out carefully Luke's gospel was the result of painstaking investigation. This man didn't leave any stone unturned. Um, Luke, more than anyone else in the early church, had the ability and the opportunity to consult with eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry and consolidate their accounts. Amen. So he sat down and he spoke to all the apostles, all 12 of them, even the new one that was elected by the Holy Spirit that only met Jesus in spirit form after he raised from, from the dead. How amazing is that, family? So he got an account from both sides, Jesus in flesh and Jesus in spirit as well. Um, he spent more than two years during Paul's imprisonment in Caesarea, as in the book of Acts 24, during which time he would have been able to meet and interview many of the apostles and other eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. We know, for example, that he met with Philip, as in Acts 21, who was undoubtedly one of Luke's sources. So here we can see again, this is just a little bit of history for us that have never gotten into the book of Luke. In his travels, in Luke's travels, he also encountered the apostle uh, John, Joanna, um, wife of Herod's steward, and mentioned only in Luke's gospel, so she must have been a personal acquaintance of his. Luke also related details about Herod's dealing with Christ not found in the other Gospels. This man did a thorough research, as in Luke 13 and in Luke 23. There's some homework for us who's interested. Um, he calls Theopolis most excellent. This was a title used to address governors. Are we there? Yep. As in Acts 23... Acts 24 and Acts 26, this sort of language was reserved for the highest dignitaries, suggesting that Theopolis was such a person. Verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Listen what this man is saying. He's saying to us, Altham Baptist Church, you read my gospel. You will know that I have told you the truth. That's it. No gossip. It's the absolute truth. They didn't sit around and have tea parties and, and, and add all sorts of things to a story. No, he wanted the absolute truth to give to you and me to be able to build a successful New Testament church. Um. The certainty of those things, not the perfect claim of authority, though Luke drew from other sources, as in verse 3, he regarded 
the reliability and authority of his gospel as superior um, to uninspired sources. So again there he's saying, I don't know what you heard on Google, but go and read my gospel, that's the truth. Okay? And then taught. Theopolis had been schooled uh, in the apostolic tradition, possibly even by the apostle Paul himself, yet the written scripture by means of the gospel sealed the certainty of what he had heard. We go to verse 5. In the time of Herod, here we get to the, the, the cream of, 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 of the, the cake this morning, family. This is beautiful. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zachariah. Zachariah. A lot of people mispronounce my name as well. Who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. We're going to see all of this come through now. This Herod they're speaking about here is Herod the Great. This was the big daddy of all Herods. This was the man that started the problems. Okay? Just for, for a, a, a little bit of uh, uh, backstory. Zechariah meaning Jehovah has remembered. What a beautiful name. Huh? Again, family, if you're sitting here this morning and you have not yet had children, looks like the majority of us should have had already, but if you have not yet had and you're planning, sit down and ask the Lord for a, a blessed name to give to your child. Amen. A name that means something in his kingdom. It will carry your child into this world, into their calling, plan and purpose. Um, Luke is the only one of the four Gospels that tells this event of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Um, perhaps he knew them. I'm saying that because I wasn't there. I didn't meet them. I'm saying perhaps he knew them. Uh, the scripture is not specific on how Luke knew this that he is telling us. He speaks of the priestly division of Abijah. The temple priesthood was organized into 24 divisions, with each division serving twice a year for one week, as in 1 Chronicles 24. Abijah's was the eighth division, as in 1 Chronicles 24.10. Okay, so this is just... Um, Going back to the Old Testament, showing us where this comes from. Abijah was a priest in the time of David. Family, if you didn't, if you don't know this man, go back into the Word of God and read about this, this priest. This, this man was, he stood for God and that's it. Nothing and no one else. He was um, the ancestry of Zechariah, Zachariah. Um, it seemed as though Zechariah and Elizabeth were both of um, priestly ancestry, as we just read in uh, verse 5 now. Luke places the time here as during the time of Herod, Herod the Great, as we said. We see here a family who are in close contact with God. It's, it's plain and simple, family. The husband and the wife serve the Lord God Almighty and only Him. And we're going to see now how we can see and say that. Verse 6. Both of them, Elizabeth and Zechariah, both of them were righteous in the sight of important people of the church. No. Both of them were righteous in the eyes of God. Amen. Amen. Family, sometimes people praise people that shouldn't be praised. Yeah? Because if you ask the Lord God Almighty, Lord, should this person receive praise, the Lord might say, Ooh, no. Okay? But here we see that both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Why? Observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Family, can 
this world and can your family say the same about you and me? That you are a righteous man and woman. You observe all the commands of the Lord. You are blameless. I can't fa find fault with you. Yes, I make up false stories, but I can't find fault. Amen. Family, that's what we are striving towards. Amen. <coughs> Not amen. We go on. <laughs> Both righteous before God. They were believers. They were followers. They weren't only proclaimers. They were believers and followers. Justified in God's sight. There is a clear echo in Paul's theology in this expression. Paul tells us to do the same thing. Stop talking too much. Start living. Stop telling people you are Christian. Make them see it in your deeds, in your actions. Very important, family. We see here two people who have been raised in the way of the Lord. Their parents, being godly people, have raised them to have great respect for God and His commands. Wow, family. This is a recipe for those of us sitting with children right now and for those planning to have children. If your children do not love God better than you love God. If my children do not love the Lord God Almighty more than I do, I have failed them. That's it. I'm saying that about myself as a dad. No, that means. From their <laughs> mouth, they had been followers of God and they had not strayed from their early teachings. They are esteemed very highly by the Lord because their desire is to please Him. Amen. We walk out of our houses tomorrow to get into our cars to take the children to school, get into our cars to go and do shopping, get into our cars to go to our workplaces. The first thing that must ring through our spirits is, Lord, how can I please you today? How? The, the recipe has changed over the past 20 years where we get in our cars and we put in a CD to say, how can I please myself today? Yeah. How can I grow bigger and stronger and get more likes and followers? And here we can see these people, the only thing that they wanted to do in their whole life is to please God, nothing else. Verse 7, it's more interesting. But they were childless. Because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now, family, if you know the Jewish people and the Jewish traditions, I'm, I'm going to jump the gun here, so we'll get to that now. This was seen by many as a sign of divine disfavor. If you were a, a Jewish couple and you could not have children, People would say of you that you are a sinner. Something's wrong here. The Lord has struck you with this, this um, barren uh, uh, womb. And so we go from there for the Hebrew women to be barren was thought to be a curse from God. We see two people very devoted to God. People who, in, uh, who the community is looking down on because they don't have children they are past the time of bed. Now you can imagine this, family. And again, the recipe has changed in the society we're living in today. If today you don't have a flash car and you don't have uh, Gucci clothes and, and the right bag and, and the hairstyle and all the, 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 the nails and you don't have money flowing in and out and through your bank account, then, then you are old. You are cursed, brother. You cursed, sister. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. But in these days, if you could not bear children, because children, especially um, sons, to a Jewish man was wealth. So go back 2,000 years. If Sharice and I lived 2,000 years ago, I would have been rich. Because the Lord gives me two at once. Amen. For those who don't know, when we were praying um, for a second child, I walked past my, my wife's... Um, 
prayer room one morning and I heard her pray and say to the Lord God Almighty, please, Father, my husband will not want another child after this. Can you please give me six? <laughs> I then knew my prayer life should be up to date. Amen. <laughs> anyway, verse 8 and 9. Once, when Zacharias' division was on duty and he was serving as priest before the God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The priesthood remained in a certain family who were called of God to tend to the affairs of the temple. Zechariah was a priestly or of a priestly family um, and his job was to burn incense twice a day in the temple. This family was a huge privilege for a priest, huge. Um, a high honor as in Exodus 30 uh, or Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles 29 because of the large number of priests, most would never be chosen for such a duty and no one was permitted to serve in this capacity twice. Zechariah no doubt regarded this as a supreme moment in a lifetime of a priestly service. The incense was kept burning continually just in front of the veil that divided the holy place from the most holy. The um, lone priest or the, the, the main priest would offer the incense every morning and every evening while the rest of the priests and worshippers stood outside um, the holy place in prayer as we are going to see in verse 10. We learn this in the book of Exodus that the smoke of the incense burned twice a day in the temple is symbolic of the prayers of the saints. Remember we just came out of uh, the book of Revelation where we saw there that angel put on uh, that altar the prayers of the saints and that was a sweet smelling incense to the, the, the Lord. Remember we said back then family there's one of two things that the Lord God Almighty can say about your prayers and my prayers. He can either say it smells sweet or ugh. Amen? Yeah. Make sure it's the first one. Yeah. Okay? Um, where are we? Uh, special perfume uh, in the middle there. Special perfume was to be burnt and it must be burnt in the morning and the evening. This was Zachariah's job. The altar was uh, before the Lord. Verse 10, we just spoke about this now. And when the time uh, from the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. How amazing is this, family? This shows us um, biblical unity. Biblical unity. In the book of Exodus, I'm pretty sure... No, I'm going to make a mistake if I say that. In the book of Exodus... The Bible teaches us that, that um, uh, Moses um, took a tent and pitched it outside of the camp and he called it the tent of meetings. And the Bible says that every day he would go to that tent and he would meet the Lord in the tent. And the Bible says that the, the, the pillar of cloud would come down in front of the tent, which was the Lord, and the Lord would speak to, to, to Moses. If we can remember, uh, Joshua was in the tent of meeting with Moses, and that's why the Lord then chose him to... Um, and if you go and you read that piece of scripture, it says there every time Moses went into the tent of meeting to pray or to speak to the Lord God Almighty, the rest of the Israelites would worship at their homes. Not go and do their own thing. That's unity family. That's a church doing the same thing. The same time. The same way. And that's what makes a church unstoppable. Is unity. So the people were not allowed to come into the holy place. 
Um, so they were in the outer courts. This burning of the incense, uh, as I said uh, uh, above, was associated with prayer. This shows us how important we said this, it is to pray at least twice a day. Family, do you know how sad it is that, that religions on this earth outside of Christianity, let's take the Islam, I'm going to have to edit this out of the, the video now, but let's take the Islam um, religion, the Muslims. They close their businesses between, I'm pretty sure it's 1 and 2 or 12 and 1, every single day, every day. They chase people, customers, paying customers, out of their businesses to close so that they can go and pray for an hour to a God that doesn't exist. The question is, family, how many times did you and I pray this, this week that passed now? Family, prayer is conversation with God. If you are married to your husband or to your wife and you never speak to them, how will you know who they are, what their heart is. You won't know their personality, you, nothing. If we do not pray, we will not get to know our God. It's as plain and simple as that, family. Um, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord, this is while he's burning this incense um, in, in the holy uh, place. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. Here we see this angel, a ministering spirit. For those who know the word of God, you'll know that in the book of Hebrew, the Bible teaches us that do you not know that angels have been given to us as ministering spirits? Okay? Listen what that scripture says, family. They are ministering spirits. They're not butlers. Okay? They will only do what Jesus tells them to do. Okay? They minister to us what the Lord wants us to do. To see and hear. And so we see here in uh, this uh, angel or ministering spirit. A messenger from God to Zechariah. Zechariah and his wife have undoubtedly been praying um, for a child. Okay, So God has heard their prayers. God has purpose for this baby at this very time. So let's see what happens there. Family verse 12. When Zechariah saw him he was startled and gripped with fear. Now, anyone that knows the Old Testament will maybe know why this man is now fearful, okay? Fear is a normal response and an appropriate one when someone is confronted by a divine visitation uh, or a mighty work of God, as in Judges 6, uh, Judges 13, and Mark 16. Luke seems especially uh, to take note of this, he often reports fear in the presence of God and his work. And there's all the scriptures uh, to go along with that. So Luke, when he speaks of fear, is not the fear that we know. Oh, quickly, you must put on your mask. You're going to no, that's not that fear. This fear is reverence, respect. Amen. It's, it's respect for, uh, for, for God. Sometimes when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies with sin in his life, God would strike him down dead. And I, this is just my personal unpublished opinion, I am sure that this flashed before Zechariah. When he saw this angel and he was standing with this um, gift to God, maybe he was thinking to himself, searching the files, where did I sin? Amen. And so this is how much this man um, respected God, is that he did not want to place a foot wrong at all. And so uh, probably terror would be a close uh, or closer description to um, this. Uh, verse 13, we're almost done family and then we can go and... Verse 13, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid Zachariah, family... <laughs> If you are sitting here this evening and you have ever come face to face with a spiritual being, you will know that this statement that this angel is making is really difficult to, to you know, take to heart. Because angels don't have the same forms as us. They don't have a size limit. Okay? And the power and authority that is 
is, is manifesting out of them is, is you, you cannot describe it. And the first thing that the angel says is, don't fear. <laughs> and you're standing there, yes, I'll try. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And so, um, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son and you are to call him John. John. You are to call him John. Now, it's going through some of our minds. Who's this John? Who's this John? We're going to get into it now. Your prayers. Probably a prayer for children to be in his home. This is probably what he was praying. Why John? We spoke about this. John means Jehovah has shown grace. Amen. Anyone who's sitting here this morning whose name is John, you are blessed. Amen. <laughs> Even if it's your second name, start using it as your first name. Amen. Yeah. Jehovah has shown grace. The message of God um, to his own has always been fear not. Don't fear. Do not fear. This angel immediately reassures Zechariah that good and not bad has come to him from God. God has heard his prayer. He will have a son um, that he has longed for. Amen. Again, a Jewish man, his riches and his wealth is in his sons. And he's old. We just read that now. And he does not have that wealth. And so he's walking in the street and other Jewish um, men are saying to you, you're not a true man, you. You're not a real man, you. I, a lot of men have said that uh, about me because I don't have bulging muscles and I'm not tall and I don't have money peeling out of all my pockets. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this poor man, and, and he must have lived in the temple because he didn't want to go out into society because this is maybe what people said about him. He will have a son that he longed for. The angel tells him that he is not to name him a traditional name of his people or his father's name, but is to give him the name John. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Can we remember going back to our great granddads? Yeah. The previous men before him, the five men before him had the same name. Same name. So you had a family's dinner and you say John and five people look... I can know that job. But yeah, the angel is saying, no, we break away from tradition. Amen. And now we go with what is anointed by God. And it will be this name. And we're going to see why now, family. Verse 14. He will bring joy and delight to you. This boy will bring you joy and delight. Yeah. Not a lot of us can say that after having a baby. Yeah. And four years down the line, you still haven't slept. <laughs> Where's the joy and the light? He's saying this boy will bring you joy and the light. Um, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Hallelujah, family. Hallelujah. Already speaking this over um, this, uh, this boy. Joy and the light. The hallmarks of the messianic um, kingdom. As in Isaiah 25, Psalms 14 and, and 48. The topic of joy runs through Luke's gospel as in these verses. This man concentrated on the joy of the Lord. Amen. The joy of the Lord. Why, family? Because he met the apostles after Jesus was resurrected and went back to the Father. So he is not physically with them anymore, but still the joy has not left them. Amen. They're sitting in prison with chains, worship it. They use the chains as instruments. Praise the Lord, praise it. Huh? In prison. Amen, family. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. Um, verse 15. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Hallelujah. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. Another translation says strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before birth. Okay. Drink. No wine, nor strong um, drink. This was a key element uh, of the Nazarite vow as in number six. Um, and would probably have been understood 
as such by Zechariah. Uh, usually such a vow was temporary, but Samson, as in Judges, and Samuel, as in 1 Samuel, was subjected to it uh, uh, from birth. They lived with it straight through. Uh, the language here is similar to the angel's instructions uh, to Samson's parents in Judges 13. However, no mention is made here of any uh, restriction to the cutting of John's hair. Okay? Luke may have, I'm going to say may because I wasn't there, Luke may have simply skipped that detail to avoid weighing his Gentile audience down with the details of Jewish law. Okay? So it's a possibility that just as uh, Samson, um, John, by the way, those who haven't picked it up yet, family, this John that we are speaking of here is John the Baptist. Amen? For those who haven't picked it up. Um, so this... John will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Similar to Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, 1 verse 5, we all know that one. This illustrates God's sovereignty in salvation. Amen. From the first day that you were in your mother's womb, you were chosen. You belong to me. I have called you. This is what he is saying to this dad about his son. Um, John is to walk upright all his life. God has a job for him to do. He is not to get involved with the world. It's not just John family. It's us as well. The Lord has got a job for us to do. We are not to get involved in the world. We must stay away from the world. The Bible teaches us that we are not to conform to the image of the world, but we are to be transformed in the renewing of our minds every single day. Amen? Amen. This world is trying to get us to conform, conform, conform. Where are we now? Um, he uh, is anointed of God even while he is in his mother's womb. We see this um, baptism when Mary comes to see Elizabeth while they are both expecting the Holy Spirit will cause the baby John to leap in his mother's womb. Amen. If you are a sister in Christ sitting here and the Holy Spirit has anointed you and in your pregnancy, the Lord has caused that to, to happen to you. You will know that that's a feeling you cannot explain. You cannot. It's different to kicking. So my, my wife carried twins and, and when she was eating and they wanted of that food, they would wrestle with each other. And... But then, in worship sessions, Cherise would worship in church, and the Holy Spirit would stir those boys, and they would go, they would worship like her. Amen? And so, from, from the womb, uh, this boy was anointed. Verse 16, he will bring back, bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Meaning that a lot of Israel has steered away. When John goes through the country preaching, repent and be baptized, many of the children of Israel do exactly that. John will be the voice crying in the wilderness um, that the Lord is coming. Many will believe and be baptized. We read last week out of the book of Mark, that scripture that said that the whole of Jerusalem came out and they were baptized. After that, we said, once they were baptized, maybe not the whole of Jerusalem continued to follow the Lord because that's how people are, the sheep. Oh, okay, here's a crowd going this side. Let's go with him. Yeah. So, and yeah, we can see that many will, will go out when, um, verse 17, and then we are almost done, family. We, yeah, we are done. Verse 17, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit of the power of Elijah to, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
In the spirit of the power of Elijah, what did Luke mean there? Elijah, like John the Baptist, was known for his bold, uncompromising stand for the word of God, even in the face of a ruthless ruler, as in 1 Kings 18, um, excuse me, and in Mark 6. The final two verses of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5, um, 4 verse 5 and, and 6, had promised the return of uh, Elijah before the day of the Lord. The very last scriptures in the Old Testament promised that Elijah will come back. John would be a voice proclaiming the coming of the Lord. His message was simple, repent and be baptized. John in this was showing their great need for a savior. Amen. This was this main thing. Now, family, I'm going to end with this this morning. What we can take out of what we read this morning is what one of our sisters testified this morning. Family, if you are sitting here this morning and you have been praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying, and praying a million times praying for something or someone and it hasn't happened yet, don't stop. Don't. You could be a day away from an angel appearing to you, which would be an amazing testimony for next week. Amen? <laughs> so you could be so close to hearing, don't stop. Here we can see these two people at an old age. The Bible doesn't say how old they are, but if the Bible says, Luke says they were old, they were old. Okay? And they were past the time of having children. That's how old they were. And so they did not stop praying. Even in that, even when something looks useless, family, keep on praying. Keep on. Because for my heart, family, when we pray in a useless situation, we are not talking to people that can then give us useless opinions. We're talking to our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. And the more we pray to our Father in heaven, the more we will hear His voice, the greater His voice will get in our lives. The more we will want to please Him, so the more we will want to pray. Family, you don't just have to pray, Thank you, Lord, that I am awake this morning. Bless you in Jesus' name. And go on, on, on to your family. Pray. In, in Hebrew to English means conversation with God. Speak to the Lord, family. Speak to Him as your God, as your Father, as your Master, your Rabbi. Speak to Him. If you don't understand something that's happening in politics, don't phone clever people. You're going to get a non-clever answer. Yeah? Speak to the Lord about politics. Speak to the Lord about the Word of God. Speak to the Lord about your church, about your family, about your children. Speak to the Lord, family, because He is the one that's got the best answers for us. Listen to what I said. He's got the best answers. We might not many times like them, yeah? because many of those answers will be, my boy, you will receive what you are asking for when you repent of this. Yeah? yeah? Turn from this. I don't like this. This isn't pleasing to me. When you repent of this and turn from this, uh, you, 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 you'll receive this. Amen. We can see scripture upon scripture in the word of God concerning that as well, family. That as soon as God's people turned to him and they repented and they followed him and they worshipped him, the Lord's hand opened. Amen. Yeah. Family, we must stop fooling ourselves and thinking that we can get away with sin. We can't. Mm -hmm. Father God hates sin. Sin has got no place in his kingdom. And if we here as the body of Christ are worshipping the Lord and serving the Lord, we are part of his kingdom. If we are sinning, it is outside of his kingdom, family. So go into this week in Jesus' name and see, family, just like these two people, Elizabeth and Zachariah, how can I please my father today more than I did yesterday? Ask him, family. He's honest. He's not a man that he will lie. He will tell you, my boy, my girl, I don't like you doing this, but, but, but I like you doing this. Mm -hmm. Amen. And then turn from that family and, and, and serve the Lord. The, the second part of uh, uh, chapter one, uh, we'll go through tonight at 6.30 for anyone that's interested. Amen. Amen. If you are sitting here this morning as we pray now, and uh, 
You have a desire, family, to draw closer to the Lord. You have a desire to please Him more. And I pray that you will call out to the Lord right now as we pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, blessed, blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for your heart towards us. We thank you for the gift of life this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that all those years um, back, Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, you were protecting these brothers and sisters of ours, Lord, so that they could, could get through horrific situations, persecutions and imprisonments, Lord, and, 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 and death, so that they can go through all of that, Lord, with a pen in their hands, writing down everything that we need to know to build a successful New Testament church in the day that we are living in. I pray, Lord, that we will not be fools, that we will be wise, Lord. I pray that we will look at these scriptures, Lord Jesus, and learn from them, Lord, to see in the scripture that it pleases you, Lord, if we focus on your commands and we love your commands and, and, and we don't partake in what this world has for us, Lord Jesus. But we draw closer to the throne of our Father, trying our utmost best every single day to please him more and more and more, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. Thank you for everyone sitting here this morning. I thank you, Father God, for everyone that has blessed me and my family over this past uh, month, Lord. I pray that whatever they did and gave to us, that they will receive 30, 60, and 100 fold back, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father God, that as we sit down now as a family and we have a meal, Lord, that you will bless the food to our bodies, that you will bless the, the, the hands that prepared the, the meals, and that you will bless those that do not have what we are about to be blessed with, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, family. Have a beautiful week.